Welcome to Behind the Schemes, a discussion of how commerce, corruption, and counterfeit cures are destroying our planet's precious wildlife. This is Risha Kota Larsen with Behind the Schemes, and in this episode, we're talking about Asia's three rhino species. Many people are still unaware that there are more species of Asian rhino than African rhino. Unfortunately, two of the three Asian rhino species are critically endangered. Carrie Crosby, founder of the Asian Rhino Project in Australia, gives us an overview of the Javan, Sumatran, and Greater One-Horned Rhinos of Asia. A lot of people still don't know that there are rhinos living outside of Africa. Can you tell us about the three Asian species and where they live? Yeah, um, there is three Asian species are scattered across four countries, um, Nepal, India, Indonesia, and um, Malaysia and Borneo. Um, they're all seriously threatened, primarily due to poaching and habitat fragmentation. Um, they were once spread right across Asia, but, yeah, now they're confined to um you know, four countries. Mm -hmm. um, there's no more than 200 Sumatran rhinos, uh, 44 Javan rhinos, and around wow. about, I think the, the latest figures are suggesting there's about 3,000 Indian rhinos. So all, all the species put together are less than that of the critically endangered black rhino in Africa. So, um, yeah, it's pretty scary. Oh, my gosh. How, you said they were spread across Asia, how widespread uh, were they? Okay, well, the Indian rhinos um, were spread right across um, the Himalayas, the um, right throughout Nepal and India. Yeah, they're, they're sort of now confined to a lot smaller and um, separate, you know, areas where basically... Um, once before they, they were able to roam quite freely. Um, the Sumatran rhinos were found um, right through southern China, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, hmm. um, yeah, right the way through Malaysia Peninsula, which they recently have been um, suggested that, you know, they no longer exist within there and they hmm. can only be found in Borneo in a tiny little population there in um the Tabin Wildlife Reserve in Danham Valley. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's quite frightening really how diversely they used to be found and now it, they're just down to small little pockets um, within these little countries. Was the Javan rhino as, that? it was also as widespread as the Sumatran rhino, was it not? Yeah, yeah, they, um, they've been found, um, they're currently found in a tiny little population in um, Ujong Kulon National Park on the most western tip in Java. Mm -hmm. um, up until 2010, there was a small population in Vietnam, but unfortunately um, the last rhino was um, found there and, and declared the population declared extinct in Vietnam in 2010. Um, but I believe they were found as widespread as Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and maybe even in China. Oh, my gosh. Now, mm, how, yeah. how does it happen that these animals are found in all these places and now we're just down to, you said, less than... 200 Sumatran rhinos and less than 50 Javan rhinos. How and and they're extinct in so many countries. How is it that these numbers got so low? How was that allowed to happen? Well, basically, then um, the the primary threat to these guys is poaching. They're poached for their horn mainly, mm -hmm. um, and it's used in all sorts of ancient. Chinese medicine, traditional mm. medicines. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Um, the the trade in in an, in wildlife, um, the illegal trade in wildlife, is actually apparently second only to the illegal trade in firearms and drugs. So it's quite organised crime. Um, you know, getting these rhino horns and and uh -huh. different body parts. Um, so it's that's been their primary downfall. Um, one of the more, you know, recent issues that we're facing is because mm -hmm. 
populations have become so small and they've become so isolated. We're, we're facing population fragmentation. So when they're living in these fragmented populations, how do you get them together? What can be done? Well, one of the um, things that we're looking at, um, particularly in India, um, is relocation programs. Mm -hmm. um, trying to repopulate areas where rhinos um, have been become extinct or the rhino population numbers are very low and, and get other uh, rhinos in there to increase the genetic viability and so forth. Um, it's a little bit more difficult uh, regarding the Sumatran and Javan rhinos because mm -hmm. um, not, a lot, not, not a lot is known about them and we actually, you know, don't have specific data on what females and males we have um, our population makeup um, and so forth because they're so elusive and hard to find. Mm -hmm. um, we've got programs in place where we're trying to get video footage of them, mm -hmm. um, which is proving quite successful. Um, and we're also at the moment supporting a project in Sumatra to do non-invasive DNA analysis of the rhinos within Wakumbus National Park, which is very exciting. Oh, yeah, that sounds excellent. Now, regarding the Javan and the Sumatran rhinos, um, you're talking about the fragmented populations, and they live in areas that are affected by palm oil production. Is that right? Yeah, palm oil, illegal logging, and mm -hmm. agriculture, you know, a wide summary of <laughs> some of the issues that they face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now, about the uh, the Indian rhinos, they have some habitat issues as well, but it's a little bit different than the Sumatran and Javan rhinos. Is that right? Um, yeah, in, in a sense, um, you know, different areas face um, different complications. Um, the the Indian rhinos, I mean, they're breeding really well, and, mm -hmm. you know, do you take Kazaranga, for example, the population is bursting at the seams, which is fantastic news. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, one of the – when you're looking um, at one of the issues that we're facing in India is the human-rhino conflict and mm. um, rhinos straying outside of their habitat to find more water sources and, mm -hmm. and um, food sources. So um, that's one of the problems where we face where we have to try and help provide, um, you know, wallowing areas and water, mm -hmm. eradicate weeds that have overtaken natural grasslands and, and replant native grasses and so forth to try and keep the rhinos within their habitats and, and um, reduce the human rhino conflict. And what? why would they go outside of their habitats? Are they they're looking for, you said you were putting water in there, would they be looking for food and water? And, and what happens when they get out? Um, yeah, in some areas, you know, um, if the habitat has been compromised mm -hmm. and, and there's not enough food sources um, or if and it might also depend, I mean, I'm not an expert in that field, but <laughs> it might also depend on, you know, what sort of crops are, are surrounding oh, the parks, okay. you know. It might be a lot more enticing than, what, than what's actually, you know, common grass within the, <laughs> within the park. Mm -hmm. um, so, unfortunately, the outcome of that means that, you know, humans and rhinos are both killed. Um, mm -hmm. The Indian rhinos can be very aggressive and mm -hmm. they've got really um, sharp teeth. They've got um, incisors in the front that um, can inflict a lot of damage on people and other rhinos or animals that they're trying to protect mm -hmm. um, themselves from. So, um, you know, it causes issues, you know, mm -hmm. if if people um, who are struggling to put food on the table and struggling, you know, to keep their farms and crops sustainable mm -hmm. um, are being attacked and killed by rhinos and, and as well losing their crops to rhinos, then, um, you know, they get angry and frustrated and, and it certainly doesn't help the plight of the rhino. Um, you know, rhinos are just being rhinos, but, um, yeah, it's it's – one of those issues that um, is of great concern for the um, rhinos themselves. Mm -hmm. And there's 
a lot of organizations out there that are focused on African rhinos, which is fantastic. We, we want that, of course. But a lot of people, like we were saying, they don't even know that rhinos live outside of Africa. So what was it that made you decide to start Asian Rhino Project? Well, basically, I used to be a zookeeper. That's how I, I, my, I first was introduced to rhinos. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked with the Southern White Rhino in Perth Zoo in Western Australia. And um, mm. as I was on a mad learning curve to learn everything I could about the white rhinos, mm -hmm. um, I kept coming across information here and there about the Asian species and, mm -hmm. and was quite shocked on um, – the situations that they were facing and, and thought, wow, you know, I need to find out more about these guys. And the more I tried to find out, the more I realised that nobody knew much about these guys and that, you know, it just, it was alarming. Um, mm -hmm. So I had to do something about it. And we started off um, by, you know, working on signage that covered all five species within the zoo um, mm -hmm. and then started a little group of zookeepers doing our <laughs> bit to try and raise awareness and support for the rhinos and um, then our patron Peter Hall came on board and backed us up financially and he actually contributes um, a lot of our funding um for Sumatran and Javan rhino programs, he's oh, he's behind us one hundred percent, which is fantastic. And oh, yeah. ever since, you know, we've we haven't been able, been able to stop the ball rolling, which is fantastic. It's been an incredible privilege um, to be given the opportunity to try and help, you know, these species. Oh yeah, there just isn't like you were saying. There's just not that much known about them. People do just uh, picture Africa when they picture rhinos, and then when you try to tell someone, well, there's a rhino out there that is um, covered with hair, they're they look at you like, what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually quite surprised on how many people really do know what an Asian rhino looks like, you know. I often suggest, you know, you know those rhinos that are, they look like they've been put together like a jigsaw puzzle with lots of little bumps over them and one horn and they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, that's the Indian rhino. And, and um, so, yeah, a lot of people uh, have probably seen them and know, mm -hmm. have probably heard a little bit about them, but they just don't associate them with being in Asia, they associate right. rhinos in Africa, even in Australia when they're on our back doorstep. So mm -hmm. um, it's only appropriate that we've got an NGO in Australia um, working to create awareness and provide support. So it's good. Oh, yeah, you're right there. So tell us uh, some more about your project. You mentioned uh, briefly earlier, you mentioned your um, DNA profiling project with the Sumatran rhinos. Tell us about some of your other projects that you've managed to, to do. Well, we actually don't manage programs ourselves oh, okay. mm -hmm. as such. Um, what, what we're about is um, raising awareness and support, um, trying to get funding for programs on the ground. There's mm -hmm. so many amazing organisations and incredible people working on the ground um, doing all the hard work and mm -hmm. they just need funds and um, to be able to continue their important work. So that's what we do. We, we try to source funding and provide support. It might not just be dollars but it could mm -hmm. be, you know, um, purchasing equipment and or, you know, sourcing resources and, and experts from, you know, afar or, you know, assisting in any way possible that we can. But, um for the Sumatran rhinos, we uh, currently assist the um, IRF and Yas and Badak Indonesia to run rhino protection units within uh, Sumatra and Java. Oh, excellent! Um, so these are, these are four man um, units that spend time in the park removing snares. Mm -hmm. um, it covers all wildlife, not just rhinos, which is mm -hmm. one of the things that really appeals to me as well. Um, they monitor the wildlife. Um, they monitor for signs of illegal activities such as human encroachment and logging. And mm, in mm -hmm. Sumatra, they've had actually no evidence of poaching in over six years thanks to, you know, these crews wow. working within the park. Oh, yeah. that's that is um, fantastic. We are, yeah. We also fund um, a 
help assist fund, not not just ourselves. We assist mm-hmm. with funding for the Captive Breeding Centre, um, the Sumatra Rhino Sanctuary in Wakumbus National Park in Indonesia. Oh, okay. Um, and very, yeah, they've got four rhinos there in 250 acres. Mm-hmm. And um, we're actually expecting a calf to be born this year, our very, their very first calf in Indonesia captive bred so um that's very exciting news and i wish them all the best oh that is that's um, ratu isn't it yeah ratu <laughs> and underlass underlass is actually the first um captive bred rhino to be born in captivity in 112 years oh wow so that's amazing it's another iconic moment yes <laughs> definitely um i met, think i mentioned before the um dna project that we're Mm -hmm. assisting with um that's very exciting uh, because through that we'll be able to identify individuals we'll be able to assess the genetic makeup of the individuals and um then therefore be able to um make more have more scientific approach as to how we're going to manage the population within Wakumbus and within other uh, parts. So that's very exciting. Oh, that's um, great news. Video camera tra- Yeah, video camera trapping um, is another great project where the guys have been setting up video traps around wallows and mm-hmm. getting footage of the rhinos walking past. You can They've been able to identify, I think, 32 individuals within Ujong Kulon National Park, that's the Javan rhinos, oh, that's um, that's which is great. great. Yeah. Mm, yeah, very exciting stuff. And they're also not just being able to identify individuals mm-hmm. but also getting important data on behaviour, um, mm. which we just – there's not enough known about these guys because they are so elusive. They're so hard to find in that mm-hmm. thick thick forest. Mm-hmm. Hmm. The other th- the other thing that's um, really exciting um, is the habitat restoration and, and uh, projects that are going on there, um, removing human encroachment um, in Wakumbus again. Um, last year there was 500 people and 300 houses removed from within the actual park, oh, okay. which is fantastic news. Yeah, and the guys are working on the rehabilitation of the area with elephant and rhino food plants and they've also removed a um, illegal fishing village from within the park. So they're doing some oh, incredible good. work. Yeah, we certainly don't yeah. need that inside the park. <laughs> No, that's right. <laughs> and another side, you know, working from um, there's a we support their um, intelligent law enforcement program where they have a crew that you know just work on investigating illegal activities within and, and around the national parks and you know helping the authorities gather intelligence and data to be able to carry out law enforcement, which is is really important. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Within Java, we're working on the um, assisting with the Jariska program. Um, it's basically a program that's aiming to expand the habitat for Javan rhinos. The Javan rhinos, the population in Ujong Kulon, appears, it's been stagnant and for ages, um, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's been suggested that the park has a carrying capacity for 100 rhinos, but even though they're well protected within the park, the population isn't increasing. Hmm. And um, I think, you know, um, from what I understand, it's because there's possibly issues with, um, you know, uh, food competition and Mm. and habitat viability. Um, Mm -hmm. There is an invasive oranga palm that is taking over areas in the park and it, Forms it grows so thick and and um, forms a blanket um, so tall and thick and forms a blanket um, within where it grows and other food plants can't grow from underneath it so therefore mm. the rhinos uh, uh, food opportunities have been reduced somewhat so um, where with the guys in, on in on the ground have relocated 52 families from within the park mm-hmm. area, oh, okay. um, and rhinos already been seen entering the area um, where they haven't been seen for a long time. So that's very exciting. Oh, that's fantastic news. Mm, yeah. Other things that we're doing to assist in in the habitat regeneration is 
is again expanding wallows and water sources and um, um, eventually we plan to be able to secure further habitat elsewhere and relocate rhinos there as well so that we don't have all our eggs in one basket because mm-hmm. they, they'll be susceptible to, you know, it, all you need is one event, one major mm-hmm. event and you've got all your rhinos in one spot and voila, they're gone. And they live near Krakatoa too, right? They do, yeah. Mm-hmm. The the volcanoes um, always a factor. Um, you know, further on in the future, rising sea levels oh, might okay. affect you know the lowland areas, mm-hmm. and um, also disease. You know, we're we're putting up fencing to try and uh, reduce the domestic stock wandering into the park mm-hmm. and induce introducing disease and that sort of thing. So, yeah, there's, it's it's quite an um, exciting project and um, it's very exciting being involved in it. Um, it's brilliant. Well, yeah, and both the uh, Indian rhino and the southern white rhino have made miraculous recoveries from very tiny populations. Yeah, that's right. Um, they're, they're certainly a great example of, mm-hmm. you know, when – when you get the mix right, mm-hmm. the, these guys can crack and um, they can do it well, you know. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, they don't – I believe they only reproduce at maximum one calf every three years. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, it, it's a slow process, but mm-hmm. it can be done, you know. Yes. You've got to get these rhinos together and breeding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we like every baby chance. rhinos. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, excellent! Another exciting, another exciting, you know, example of some of the projects we support in um, India is uh, the Kazaranga Rhino Rescue last year, um, where the local organisation Aranyak. Um, mm, okay. We provided funding. We provided funding for the local organisation Aranyak to give people, um, local people, the tools to detect stray rhinos exiting mm-hmm. Kazarang National Park um, mm-hmm. before any conflict arises oh, and okay. then um, giving them the tools to be able to contact the authorities to come and help them help move the rhinos back into the safety of the park. So, um, you know, it's great to be able to support programs that are working with community, mm-hmm. working together with the national parks and the NGOs um, because that's what you need, Every you know, a, a collaboration of, organizations, authorities, and, and people. Oh, absolutely. And were the communities receptive to being able to work proactively uh, regarding the, the rhinos? I believe so. Um, I think they got great support from mm-hmm. my understanding. And, um, you know, I think any anything that's going to protect people as well as rhinos yeah. um, is very attractive to everybody. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's exciting to be able to support those sorts of programs. Oh, excellent. Those all those sound fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> There's some great people out there working mm-hmm. really hard and they're putting their lives on the lines, you yeah. know. They're working in, in areas that are, you know, infested with leeches. You know? oh. <laughs> and... Mosquitoes, you know, the, a lot of the RPUs in in Indonesia that we mm-hmm. support, they can they get malaria and ah. you know, are subjected to all sorts of you know, dangers, snakes mm-hmm. and oh, tigers, and you know, and and they still go out there and they're so proud of what they do, and yeah. it, it's just it gives you that warm fuzzy feeling, you know, <laughs> because you know that they're people that really care and they're really working hard to try and turn this situation around and, and, you know, get these populations back up there. Oh, that is so good to know. That's all really great news. That is such, such good news to hear. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm so, just so fortunate to be able to help them, you know. <laughs> they do a great job. Yeah. And so how can people support your work and become involved with the Asian Rhino Project? Well, we you can contact us through our website, um, www.asianrhinos.org.au. Um, you can donate 
Uh, within Australia, you can make a tax-deductible donation. We are a registered deductible gift recipient, which is wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can contribute to specific projects. Um, you can adopt a rhino. You can become a member um, of the Asian Rhino Project. Mm -hmm. Volunteer your time. You know, fundraise, do your own little thing, you know, have a little afternoon tea with your mates and get them to all put in a dollar and, you know, every dollar counts. If yeah, absolutely. If you forward $50, we can forward it straight to the field. So we're very fortunate to have most of our um, or all of our administration costs covered um, by a single donor. So oh, yeah. um, it means that all the funds that are directed to our conservation fund goes directly to conservation programs which is is really important oh yeah for sure yeah well it was really great to finally speak with you carrie and i really enjoyed learning more about your organization and what you guys are doing oh thank you thank you very much you're very welcome you've been listening to Asia's Three Rhino Species with Carrie Crosby, founder of the Asian Rhino Project. This is Risha Kota Larsen with Behind the Schemes.